Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our final talk on the Leonardo stage. Uh, we have Laura Bridgman, and she's going to be talking about how to engage with people in meaningful ways. Thank you, Laura. Hi. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so, yeah, thank you all for coming to this talk. My name is Laura Bridgman, and I work for an organization in Berkeley, California, called the International Marine Mammal Project. Um, so what I'm going to be going over today is how basically online actions can really translate into real-world victories for dolphins and whales and, and other causes as well. Um, so it's all about building and engaging with an online community. And I'm also going to be talking about how our organization had to evolve its strategies to it really embrace social media. And I'm also going to be talking a lot about dolphins and whales. So I hope you guys are, are into that because that's what I'm really passionate about. So. Um, so a little bit about me, um, I'm born and raised in Canada. I saw The Cove when it came out in 2009, so I was pretty impacted by that movie. Um, so I, after I finished getting my degree in environmental studies and geography from the University of Ottawa, I moved to Berkeley, interned with the International Marine Mammal Project. They hired me and I started working on um, our communication strategy and our social media. And now I'm really involved in uh, dolphin cognition research and uh, advocating for personhood rights, which I'll explain later. Um, but okay, just to give you an idea, because um, you're gonna see a lot of logos flying around here, but basically, um, the Earth Island Institute is a fiscal sponsorship organization. So it's basically a, a place where startup environmental projects go. We all share the same char charity status. Um, so the logo that says Earth Island Institute with a whale, that's the International Marine Mammal Project. We're a project of Earth Island. And um, so these four campaigns, um, I'm going to deal with the first two. Uh, throughout this presentation, but I'm also just going to talk quickly right now about these two campaigns. Um, so the International Marine Mammal Project has been around for about 25 years. Um, all of my colleagues have been involved in incredible campaign victories. They are all um, over the age of 60, so they have an incredible wealth of experience. Um, so the Free Willy Keiko project was, um, it's based on this movie that is called Free Willy. It was uh, a big blockbuster, um, I think in the 90s. And uh, it was about this little boy who developed a relationship with a captive orca whale. And they ended up, he, he ended up getting the, uh, the whale set free because it was sat in captivity. But in real life, that whale actually was, after the filming was done, was shipped to Mexico basically to die in this like, little disgusting pool. Um, it was very uh, uncared for and very sad for many years. So my organization actually rescued, his name was Keiko, so they rescued Keiko and they freed him in Iceland. It was a huge campaign, major success. And the other one is the um, Dolphin Safe Tuna. This is a label that, um, so basically in the, uh, I think it was the late 80s, there was a video taken of um, a tuna fishing vessel. And it was discovered that these tuna fishing vessels actually capture and kill uh, many, many dolphins every year. They were killing hundreds of thousands before this label was put in place. So my organization was able to, through a lot of pu huge public awareness campaign and, um, and lots of other ways, it was, it was a really big deal, but they got um, over 90% of tuna companies worldwide to ascribe to this label. So we save hundreds of thousands of dolphins every year. So those two campaigns, very successful, but they were all done basically through fax machines. <laughs> I don't know if you guys know what this is. This is, this is called a fax machine. It's, um, people used to use it a lot um, in the 90s and the 80s for campaigning. We don't anymore, which is a good thing because, I mean, there was a lot of wasted paper. Um, so I, I never used one. I don't know about you guys, but anyway. Um, so I'll just talk to you quickly about The Cove, which is what brought me to this organization and is what got our organization this huge amount of, uh, of publicity. So I'll play you the trailer. How many people have seen The Cove, by the way? Show of hands. Oh, nice. All right. But I do want to say that we try to do the story legally. There it is. A little town with a really big secret. It's so bizarre. What's going on over here? When we first got in the country, we had no idea who was following us. You think they know we're here? We didn't know if it was the whalers, the Japanese mafia. Somebody's behind me. I don't know who that is. They don't like me. 
They don't like my message. Rick is world famous for his work with dolphins. I feel somewhat responsible because it was the Flipper TV series that created this multi-billion dollar industry. The dolphin smile is nature's greatest deception. It creates the illusion they're always happy. You realize after a while they don't really belong in captivity. I'd never seen so many dolphins before. The Japanese people don't even know about it. They take the boats around to the secret cove that nobody could see. They're afraid of cameras. They said if the world finds out what goes on here, we'll be shut down. They were hiding something. We need to get in there and film exactly what happens. We need to know the truth. We needed people with a special set of skills to implement this mission. They're behind me. Let's go, let's go. Good luck. Underwater camera is set. They're not being told that the free lunch meat that their children are getting are contaminated. Let it not be said that you didn't know about it. You know about it. If we can't fix that, there's no hope. Okay, there's a flashlight. The guards are moving. The guards are moving. Get out of there. Get out of there now. Okay, so um, yeah, it's a very sad movie. But um, so the star of the movie um, and the guy that, that you see there in the corner of the photo, his name is Rick O'Berry. He's a um, so he's campaign director for our Save Japan Dolphins and Dolphin Project campaigns. So I work closely with him. Um, so he was the uh, he became famous because he was a flipper trainer. So this show was uh, in the 1960s. It kind of popularized dolphins in general. People used to think they were kind of scary sea monsters, but after the TV show, people came to understand that they're very intelligent, very playful, and gregarious. So it kind of kickstarted the entire captivity industry, which is places like Sea World. Um, so Rick used to be a trainer. He became an activist the day that his favorite dolphin died in his arms. So what happened was um, there was five dolphins that played flipper, but his favorite one was Kathy. They just had a very close relationship. And after the filming of the show ended, Rick uh, left and traveled the world, um, but the dolphins had to stay in their pools because they had no choice. When Rick came back, he heard that Kathy was very ill and maltreated and, and just not taken care of. And he went to see her, and, he w and uh, the minute he laid on, eyes on her, he saw that she was very, very sick. He jumped in the water, and she swam into his arms. And uh, she looked him in the eye and closed her blowhole. And because dolphins are not voluntary breathers like you and I, we don't really have to think about breathing, but dolphins calculate every breath they take. So they also have the ability to just decide not to ever take another breath, and that's what she did. So Rick thinks that, or he says that she committed suicide in his arms. So from that day forward, he became a dolphin activist. So um, on the very Earth, first Earth Day, he tried to rescue this other captive dolphin uh, from its sea pen, almost died in the process. He went to jail afterwards, but he, that was the day the Dolphin Project was born. And he's been advocating for dolphin and whale rights um, ever since. So in 2003, he went to Taiji, Japan, which is where the cove uh, takes place. And he joined Earth Island Institute's International Marine Mammal Project as campaign director for uh, Sa well, Sage Pan Dolphins. So this campaign was focused directly on, on the, uh, what was going on in the movie. Um, and so in 2009, the movie came out. Uh, 2010, it won an Oscar. And then chaos ensued. So I'm going to explain that in a minute. And this photo shows um, this is actually at the Academy Awards in Los Angeles. Um, that this guy right here is Luis Sohoyos. Sorry, the quality is so bad. I don't know why that's happening. So this is actually the director of the Cove, and this is Rick holding up. Um, this photo was taken about a fraction of a second before the cameras were turned immediately off of Rick because you're not supposed to do this kind of thing at the Academy Awards. But basically, when you texted 4414 um, on your phone we would send a letter to Washington and to the Japanese government on your behalf. And this is also a really great, great way to drive people to our websites. Um, and this is what added to the chaos. So in our office, um, there was three people at the time. Now there's five. Um, our office was bombarded with uh, phone calls, women crying, um, asking so many questions. We got hundreds of letters every week children drawing pictures of dolphins and everyone asking questions. And 
But the most frequently asked question that everyone did was, what can we do to help? And it actually turns out that this is a very important question to be able to answer. So we were uh, in a situation that every nonprofit uh, organization just dreams of, where we had like millions of people contacting us saying, like, how can we support your efforts? What can we do? And at that time, we didn't have the infrastructure set up to answer that question. Um, but it turns out that the, qu that the answer was absolutely in social media. So um, some of the response to the chaos. So we set up, this is all before I started working there, by the way. Um, they set up Sage Pan Dolphins. We had some uh, petitions that we keep go on going. Um, we have a, a few hundred thousand signers on these already. So that's some of what we told people what they can do. Um, we had a volunteer in Colorado. She set up our uh, Sage Pan Dolphins Facebook and Twitter pages. And those are the, that's the numbers where they are right now. We had another uh, a woman in Los Angeles set up the Cove Facebook page and our causes list. I don't know if you guys know what the causes platform is, but it's basically a way for nonprofits to communicate with their audience. We can do um, direct emails and we just post actions. So um, if you, you can check us out online if you have smartphones. Um, it's just the causes.com slash the Cove. So we have over a million people on that list. Um, and the way we were broadcasting news at that time was um, we would post blogs, not only about the situation in Japan, but we had other campaigns going at the time as well. Um, but the news would all just go onto our blog and um, first Save Japan Dolphins. We didn't have RSS set up even. Um, and we just had our volunteers in Colorado and LA posting on our social media. So they weren't even in the office with us. And although they did a really amazing job, um, it was just, it's, it's not what it could have been because, um, I mean, they were posting whenever they remembered to, basically. But, um, so we needed to really focus more on that. And also, the media list that we had, while we did have one at the time, um, a lot of it got lost when people translated from faxing to emails. So um, that could have, that, that needed some work as well. So another thing that, we, uh, that was happening at this time, again, before I was hired, was um, we needed to draw the links between the slaughters and the captivity industry because we wanted to focus on the demand. So basically, what happens in the cove is that they drive the dolphins in, um, they select a few of them for captivity, the ones that are very beautiful and don't have a lot of scars in their body. They train them, and then they ship them off to aquariums and dolphinariums around the world. And that a live dolphin can fetch about $150,000. So um, but the rest of their, their, the pod that is driven in gets slaughtered and uh, they're used for meat and a dead dolphin brings about $600 in. So the, the incentive for the slaughters is squarely in captivity. So uh, Take Part, which was our promotional partner for the Cove, created this PSA um, that drove people My to our website. My friend is so much fun. He's always playing tricks on people. He is so smart. In fact, he's one of the most intelligent beings on the planet. This friend can literally see through me. And I'm not kidding. My friend races sailboats and always wins. My friend has no problem hitting a high no. My friend can surf waves 25 feet high with no board. I'd like to see you try that. This friend can understand us, but we can't understand him. He saves lives. He saves lives. He saved human lives. He's always smiling. But that doesn't mean that he's always happy. My friend doesn't belong in captivity. My friend does not belong in captivity. He doesn't belong in captivity. His home is in the ocean. But my friend is in serious trouble. In fact, he's fighting for his life right now. Right now. Right now. Off the coast of Japan, dolphins and porpoises are driven to a horrible fate. The most attractive are chosen for life in captivity. The others are brutally killed. Their meat, which contains toxic levels of mercury, is sold as food. Majority of people in Japan don't even know this is happening. Please help us end this senseless slaughter. Please help us get the word out. Please join us in getting the word out. Help us get the word out. To find out more, go to takepart.com slash the cove. We are their biggest threat and their only hope. 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 
So again, that was a really great, uh, very powerful piece that uh, drove a lot of people to our websites. Um, so we had to obviously really need to work on our um, social media and online strategies. So um, another thing that we needed to do was to reestablish the importance of Rickoberry's dolphin project. So the Save Japan Dolphins campaign focuses on Japan, but Rickoberry actually and, and the International Marine Mammal Project work on different campaigns all around the world. Um, and it doesn't really make sense to post news about that on the Save Japan Dolphins website. So um, I helped to create the Dolphin Project website and uh, the Facebook and Dolphin, the, the, the Twitter pages and the online stuff, um, which you can see we have, they've grown pretty quickly in about two years. Um, and also I've become a blogger for Take Part and we've been working on a, building a strong media list. So we have contacts at Huffington Post and New York Times. And so this is a great way to spread news of, of our work. Um, and so in the last two years, we've just seen uh, a significant increase. And it's because we're adding new content on all of our websites multiple times a week, posting on social media every single day. Um, we translate a lot of our materials. J Japanese is very important, but all of these other languages. Um, but the most important thing has been uh, we've had some really interesting campaign victories in the time that I've been there. So um, getting word out about that helps to bring more people um, into our cause and more, generates more interest. And um, also really important is building and maintaining this online community and getting people involved. Um, so I'm just going to go over two of our campaigns that really focus heavily on social media. Um, so the first one is in Japan. So um, we have uh, uh, what well, we team of what we call Cove monitors, and these are largely volunteers. Um, so Rickoberry goes to uh, Japan on September 1st of every year, which is the beginning of the dolphin hunting season. The hunting season extends from t September to sometime in March. Um, and so while he's there for a few days, and sometimes he goes back throughout the year, we uh, maintain this presence of volunteers and, and cove monitors who are armed with cameras, video cameras, and um, social media tools. And so they are just recording what happens. Um, and, uh, and so we use the hashtag tweet for dolphins and we tweet out news. So whenever there's a dolphin hunt, our cove monitors are out there and uh, we've set up a series of template tweets um, that say things like the, the time, how many boats are going out, how many dolphins they see driven in, how many were taken for captivity. And this is really useful information for us to gauge uh, what, the, like, how, what the demand is for captivity and for dolphin meat in Japan. Um, but also, and more importantly, um, it really, people are really into getting this kind of news in as real time as possible. Every time we post, we get hundreds and hundreds of shares. People just eat it up and, and they, they comment on each post and they really, um, we, we have this pretty vast network of people who they answer each other's questions because we can't always get to them. Um, and they help to spread the news a lot farther. So this has been a really successful thing. And, and also it helps keep the international spotlight on Taiji, even after the movie, you know, because it was a tidal wave of attention and it has crested, but we're still getting more and more people interested in the issue. And we also do um, use so live streaming from the Cove. If you go to Dolphin Project, we have uh, a live stream tab under the main header. And so you can actually watch the hunts taking place. And there's a social stream on the side of the, um, on the, side of the video player. And so people are able to ask questions in real time and converse with the Cove monitors and converse when, with Rick when he's there. So we have, uh, I think, close to 60,000 views so far. So that's been a really successful program. We're going to continue building it. And another thing that we do is, um, again, these are very bad quality right now, but uh, these photos kind of interchange. So um, on our Facebook page, instead of our logo for a profile picture, uh, we normally have, this is the default, the, clo the cove is blue, but when there's been a slaughter, we ask the cove monitors to change it to the red. And so when it appears in people's news feed, it's very eye-catching, and uh, it, it's kind of a little bit of a shock when you first see it turn red, because then you know that there, there is blood in the cove, unfortunately. It's kind of a gory image, but again, it's, it's really good for spreading the message. Um, so also a really important aspect of our campaign is getting the actual Japanese people involved in the issue of the slaughters, because 
we know that the change has to happen from within Japan. We can't just be a Western nation or, or the international community kind of pointing the finger at Japan and saying, hey, you guys can't do this. We need the pressure to come from the citizens of Japan themselves. So um, we do a lot of Japanese tweeting. Um, so also, Japan Dolphins Day happens on September 1st of every year, and this is a really important community building activity. So um, Rick set this up in 2004, and when I started two years ago, I was just working off of this email list of people who had done it before and um, trying to coordinate on Facebook. I set up a really rough Google map to kind of show where the different events were. But um, two years later, we have completely revamped it. We've got this new j website called japandolphinsday.net. Um, it's got an online forum so people can ask each other questions. It's got lots of downloadable material for events. So we just ask that people go out to their Japanese consulate or embassy or just a, uh, or an aquarium that, or that is in their city or uh, a highly visible public location and just peacefully voice the pro, uh, their opposition to the hunts. And we use the, uh, the hashtag JDD2013, and that changes every year, obviously. And this year, we had almost 16,000 participants. Um, it was a huge success. The numbers have easily tripled since I've started working there. So it, it just shows that the momentum is continuing to build. Um, so that's the Japan campaign. I'm going to touch quickly on um, this India campaign. So this started about, uh, it started in January 2012, actually. We partnered with an organization called the Federation for Indian Animal Protection Organizations, or FIAPO. Um, they had discovered, so in India, there are no captive dolphin facilities, not even a single one. Um, but in, in uh, 2011, late 2011, we discovered that there was a lot of proposals that were being proposed for various Indian states. And that was a really bad sign because as soon as one captivity facility uh, took, took hold, um, the floodgates would be open. A nation of over, I think it's 1.2 billion people, um, the captivity industry was just salivating to get a foothold into the nation. So we knew it would be easier to keep the floodgates shut rather than trying to close them after they were open. So we had been working with FIAPO um, throughout 2012, and we had succeeded in getting a lot of um, governments to come out with kind of informal statements and advisories. We got the Animal Welfare Board of India to advise against captivity, um, but we still needed something stronger. We needed the Ministry of Forest and Environment to enact a complete ban on captivity. And this was, it was a very lofty goal, but um, we ended up succeeding, and it was really huge. But the final push to get the ban was firmly rooted in social media and took place on our causes page. So um, like I said, we, could, we post an action and uh, we can email it out to our members, which is what we started doing. So in January 13, um, I, I, posted, I emailed out to our members because they had joined the cause page because they were opposed to the slaughters. So I needed to show, I needed to draw the links between captivity um, and India, which is, you know, the... India, if they get captive facilities, they're going to be sourcing from Taiji, most likely, and that's going to fuel more slaughters. Um, and then we put out a quiz, which is a really cool feature that Causes had. So we were able to say, how many captive facilities do you think are in the cove? And I'd, we'd put options of 105, 30, 0, or, or 20, or something like that. And uh, most people had chosen, 73% uh, chose that they thought that there was 105 facilities. So that was also an interesting way to gauge our audience's understanding of the issue. Um, and so after they completed the quiz, then we told them about our campaign and uh, what's at stake and how we're going for a total ban on captivity. Um, in January 2013, we, did a, we raised about $5,000 just through the causes campaign, um, which was really great because FIAPO needed the extra funds just to make the final push. And then on April 20 22nd, we had received some inside information that the minister that was going to be making the decision um, was very compassionate towards animals and liked kids as well. So we sent out a pledge asking people to email this sample email that we had written and to also mail in some origami. We sent around origami instructions because um, we wanted physical letters to be mailed in. Um, close to 7,000 people took that pledge. So I can only assume that there was a huge amount of emails and attention that was going to this minister, of all people asking her to make the right decision. Um, and so we also did some media work around that. In, on May 2013, we did a, a Huffington Post article that was just asking the minister to make the right decision and showing her that really the entire world was looking to her for leadership in uh, the animal rights arena. 
And uh, a day after FIAPO sent that Huffington Post article to the minister, she made the decision. So this was unprecedented um, for such a large populous country to completely ban captivity. But the more interesting thing was that it, it included this language, um, which is language that we had asked her, to, we had been infusing all of our discussions with her about the concept of personhood and according dolphins and whales basic rights, and it showed up in the statement. This is historic because no government has ever come out with such a strong statement for any animal rights, let alone dolphins. So this was really huge. Um, and it made global headlines. I didn't list any of the media here, but there was, there was a huge amount of attention. I don't know if any of you have heard about this, but... Um, right, so then we, we started seeing, we didn't make any infographics, but this is one of the things that we started seeing on social media. People just making infographics. This is a screen grab from my computer when uh, I, I subscribe to I Fucking Love Science. I don't know if you guys do. It, it's an excellent page. They ended up posting something um, that got, what, almost 100,000 likes and 30,000 shares. And so it occurred to me that infographics, this is a really interesting way to disseminate, to distill and disseminate powerful information. Because people, it seems like people would rather like and share a photo than an article. Um, so this was kind of uh, the, my, my inspiration for an upcoming campaign that, that has just been initiated. So I can't, sh I can't really show anything more to you guys than this, but it's going to be uh, disseminating infographics on social media that talk about facts of dolphin cognition. Um, and that's going to be the initial phase. And then there's going to be a large advertising component as well. But it's going to be dolphin cognition and also co explaining the idea of personhood. Because what does ascribing personhood for dolphins mean? Because dolphins aren't human beings. But that's not what that means. Um, so we're just going to act as a bridge between academia and, and the pub general public. Because this information about dolphin cognition, there's a huge and growing body of evidence about why dolphins are very, dolphins and whales are very intelligent, but people don't know because it's all buried in academic journals. So we're going to try and raise awareness about these these things. So the idea behind personhood, it's it's essentially a tack, tackling the distinction between uh, a who versus a what, a someone versus a something. Um, you can think about personhood in terms of moral personhood, moral standing, and legal personhood. Um, so we're, right now, there are groups that are advocating for legal personhood in the United States, um, for other animals as well as dolphins and whales. Um, but so if you want to take a look at this def definition, um, these are the categories for what defines um, a person. Right now, uh, under the law, under US law anyway, um, the only things that are persons are human beings and corporations, which is just another kind of disgusting issue. I'm not going to touch on that. But um, if you look at the, crit the criteria, it has now been proven that dolphins and whales possess every one of these qualities. So they meet the criteria for being pe persons. So we want to try and, and, and get people to understand that as well. Um, so this is a photo from Taiji, Japan, where these dolphins have just been captured from the ocean and they're, go they're going to be slaughtered. So these dolphins are dead. They were slaughtered the next day. Um, but this sign is the important thing. All dolphins and whales in this area are now owned by the Fishermen's Association. So if you're not a human being, you, ha you're, you are considered property. So dolphins and whales have the same rights as the chairs you're sitting on, as you know, bugs, uh, as anything, everything that is not a human being. And so uh, increasingly, the, these distinctions are false. Human beings are not the only ones who have emotions and, and meet the criteria for, for being persons. So this is the issue that we're going to be tackling. So now I'm going to start to talk about, this is my favorite part of the presentation, um, because there is this, like, like I mentioned, this enormous body of science that, that shows us that uh, dolphins and whales are a lot more intelligent than many people understand. So um, the, the cetacean brain, by the way, dolphins and whales are called cetaceans, so if I ever use that word, it, that's what that means. Um, I could go on about the cetacean brain. I don't have a lot of time. So the one thing I'm going to mention is um, 
So dolphins, so cetaceans have very similar brain structure to human beings, even though we haven't shared a common ancestor for the last 100 million years. So they call it, this is a form of convergent evolution, where we, uh, we and cetaceans have developed the same sort of brain structure. Um, so we both have limbic systems and cerebral cortex. The limbic system is responsible for emotional information processing, and the cerebral cortex is responsible for logical. Dolphins and whales have both of this. And actually, the, the cetacean brain has a much more convoluted uh, cerebral cortex than human beings, which is interesting. Um, but also, so the limbic system and the cerebral cortex are so large in cetaceans that they actually merge and they, they erupt as an extra lobe. So dolphins have four lobes in their brains rather than people, which have three. Um, so I believe the paralimbic is, is somewhere in the middle up on the top. So in the words of one uh, neuroscientist who studies dolphin cognition, her name is Laura Marino, she says that this is a, uh, likely a mashup of emotional cognitive thinking, the likes of which we just cannot understand at this point. But it's very compelling. Also, the cetacean brain is filled with these von Economo uh, neurons called spindle cells. And these spindle cells, human beings have lots of these as well. They're associated with emotional understanding and social cognition. Um, so when you take these two facts together about the dolphin brain, the reason why, the, the theory anyway, about why dolphins have evolved such large brains, the largest on the planet, is that they are, they're uh, focused on social cognition. They have very close-knit, they live together for their entire lives in these very close-knit families called pods. Um, and uh, so the, they're very complex societies. And so they value, they likely value the same things that we do, which is family and friends and uh, being in control of their own lives. Um, and it's for this reason why it becomes ethically indefensible for us to use them in any way. And so a, a, according personhood rights essentially puts cetaceans beyond human use. So that's the idea. It doesn't mean that dolphins and whales are going to be, you know, suddenly have Twitter accounts, they're not gonna be able to vote, no. It's just going to be the freedom of life, liberty, and the freedom from harm. So just the, the ability to live on their own, uh, that's what we're arguing for. So um, some of the, some more of the uh, compelling science that I'm hoping to use um, in our campaign with infographics. So dolphins um, have this sense called sonar or uh, echolocation. So bats have this as well. And the basic way that it works is, is described here. They, uh, they send out pulses of sound and then they receive the, the bounce backs and they get an image of the world in this way. Well, a cetacean sonar is the most advanced sensory system on the planet. It far outdoes any medical or military technology that we currently have. Um, and, and like the slide says, a dolphin can detect a steel ball an inch in diameter from a football field away. They can detect incredible amounts of detail. Um, and so th this is an, it, it's just interesting to think about what if we had this ability. And also, what do dolphins think of us who don't have this ability, um, and they can tell that we don't, um, because they can see through bodies. So um, what you see of me right now is a, a calm, collected person just giving you a talk. But if you were dolphins, you could see that my heart rate's a little elevated. I might be sweating a little bit, and you'd be like, oh, the, this girl is nervous. But um, you guys don't see that. Dolphins would, meaning that um, there's no way to hide anything in a dolphin society. So. And interesting to think about ways that that would affect our societies. Um, there's lots of anecdotal evidence of dolphins and whales detecting uh, pregnancies when women didn't know they were pregnant, detecting cancer when people didn't know they had it. So this is just adds to the, um, to the evidence that they can actually see through bodies and that they understand how to use that knowledge. Um, so also, there's a, there's a theory that um, so larger cetaceans, like right whales and humpback whales, or especially right whales, actually, they live in very far out extended pods. And they spend a lot of their time underneath vast ice sheets in the Antarctic and Arctic. Um, and these ice sheets only have um, very occasional holes that the whales can go and breathe in. But somehow, they can always find these holes. And scientists have always been confused about how they do that. Um, and 
so the theory now is that they can actually use one another's sonar from great distances. So they can have just an absolutely enormous view of the world um, by doing this. So that's another interesting fact. And then um, I have the, the fetuses thing up here. It's very interesting as well because when a dolphin, uh, uh, the dolphin's sonar system is fully developed and functional when it is still within the womb. So again, it's just a theory, but there, there is a theory that um, dolphin fetuses can actually look outside of the mother's womb before they exit, and that they can also communicate with their mother and their pod mates before they leave. So that's also another really interesting thing. So this is um, the humpback whale song. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of this song before. Um, Roger Payne discovered this in 1970, and uh, people before that never knew that dolphins and whales could sing. And this was actually what incited the whole environmental movement because they were being slaughtered. They were almost slaughtered to extinction. But when people heard these sounds, there was this massive movement, and uh, they said no more. And that's what enacted the global moratorium, which still exists today. So. Humpback whales compose these songs according to the same, very, very similar uh, musical conventions that people compose music to, which is really interesting. Um, they also constantly evolve their songs, um, little by little. We don't know how, the, according to what, I mean, we don't know why they do this, basically. And interestingly enough, um, so they sing in groups, sometimes they sing alone. But a, a group of scientists were studying whales in Hawaii and Mexico. These whales were singing the same song, and they were evolving the song at exactly the same time. There was no way that they could hear one another. So we don't know. That there is something to these songs, but we just we have no idea what it is, um, which is interesting. Um, OK, so I don't know if I'm going to have time to talk about all of this stuff. Um, I will talk about the tandem create. So. We don't know how, com how dolphins communicate, then we know that they squeak at each other. Um, but so this, uh, this guy named Lou Herman, he was studying dolphins in Hawaii, captive dolphins. And they, he had taught them a, a language that they completely understood. They can use syntax, which is indicative that maybe they use this in their own, uh, uh, you know, in their own communities. Although there's no proof of that, but they have the ability to learn this. Um, and so Herman gave them this command to tandem create which means create a move, but do it together. So the dolphins, um, they got the command. There was two of them. So they, they swam around. They did one lap around the pool. They emitted no sounds. And then they, at the exact same time, executed this move where they uh, twirled around while spitting water out of their mouths. And they spun around in this way that they've never done before. And they both did it at exactly the same time. So there's no way of knowing how they communicated that to one another, but it happened. Um, OK, I'm going to keep going. So also, dolphins are the only animal that, that I know of personally who regularly rescue people. Um, and so this is common knowledge. Again, it's anecdotal, but a lot of people have experienced this. Even throughout history, there are stories. But it's interesting to think about the fact that they actually rescue people. It means a lot of things. Like, they understand that uh, the human or the animal that's in the water doesn't belong there, and that it's stressed out in the first place. So how would they be able to tell that? We don't know. Um, they understand that the animal has to, in order to save it, it needs to go back to land. Um, and, and these actions do not provide any, uh, any advantage to the dolphins. So uh, according to most theories, you know, there's no reproductive advantage for the dolphin doing this. So that's compelling in itself. So I could go on and on about this stuff, um, but I don't think I will have time because um, I could go on for hours. So. Um, I'm going to end this, and maybe we, if you want to ask me some questions at the end during the Q&A period, I'll, I'll put this slide up again. Um, but before I do, <laughs> um, another way that we use social media is on fundraising. So um, we're doing this CrowdRise challenge right now where uh, if we raise the most amount of money, we can win like $75,000. So if you go to our websites, uh, this is up here. Yes, you're taking a picture of it. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> so yeah, just spread the word. Um, right, and the most asked question um, that we needed to learn how to find out how to answer, the answer is spread the word. 
And that might seem like kind of a cop-out, but it's really not because people who want to get really involved, they do get involved. They go to Taiji, they write blogs for us, but just if you want to do anything you can to help, retweet us, you know, like our Facebook pages. Just, get, just spreading the word makes a lot of difference. Um, so yeah, check us out online. Um, yeah, so that's it. So I went through that pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, so I don't know if you guys want to know about any of this stuff. Uh, some of it's anecdotal, some of it's scientific. They're, I mean, really, I could go on for hours because cetaceans are very, I mean, they're incredible beings and they deserve our respect. So that's it. Has <laughs> anyone got any questions? Any questions or anything? There's someone down here. Hi. Hi. You said that dolphins can see when people have problems, i.e. cancer or mm -hmm. what. How, and you said that they, they have that ability and they know how to use that knowledge. How do they use that knowledge? Mm. Well, it's, uh, it's impossible to know. But um, the fact that they can means that they, I mean, they must. It could be something like... Um, there's a lot of instances, all anecdotal, but of, um, of dolphins assisting one another. Like when one of their pod mates is sick, they, um, they prop it up and they get it to the surface to breathe. Um, also, when people swim with dolphins, there, there are some groups that like dance with dolphins and they, they do all this stuff. But they say that when they swim with dolphins, somehow the dolphins always know when they need to breathe. And it's as, so they lead them back up to the surface when the people are, are really getting to their limit. So I imagine that the dolphins can see that, that that's happening. Um, and it's really not unreasonable to think that. Um, so in terms of what they use it for exactly, it, it could be, I mean, it's only our guess. And with their paralimbic lobe, there's actually, um, there are theories that they literally see things about emotions that, that we can't. So that could be another thing. Like when, when they see a quickened heart rate and, and their version of perspiring, I don't know what that would be, they, they know that, that that being is stressed, their pod mate is stressed. So it, it could have any number of functions really, but we can only guess at this point. Yeah. Really, I could go on. I could go on so long. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much for that. Um, I was completely ignorant to the fact of this was happening in um, over there. What can I do to help? What would you uh, recommend? Well, you can spread the word about our organization. Um, but I mean, it depends on. The question that we have to ask you beyond just spreading the word is, what are you good at? Who are you connected with? Um, I, I mean, it, a lot of it depends on you. So if you want to get in, co in contact, I mean, I can give you my card or you can contact us um, via our websites or social media. And uh, if you can think of something to do, that's great. Um, but otherwise, like we have guest bloggers. Um, I, I mean, there are, there's, it, it really is up to you guys. Um, watching the movie and just spreading the word about it. E every time you tell somebody new, like you're someone who has learned about the issue for the first time. And that makes a big difference um, because you're probably going to talk to people about this and, and you're going to be spreading the word that way. So every time somebody new learns about this issue, that really helps. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. It's a tough question to answer, really. But... Spreading the word is, is huge. Are you guys convinced that dolphins and whales should have rights? Basic rights? Raise your hand. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much, Laura. That was a great speech. Thank you. Uh, that concludes our running for Leonardo's stage at this year's campus party. I uh, all hope you've enjoyed the experience. Thank you.